I'll draw your attention to the text of Scripture where the sermon is based, Mark chapter 14, verses 53 to the end of the chapter, verse 72. Mark 14, verses 53 to 72. As you open your Bible, let me tell you the title of the sermon. Is Irony and Glory, the Unveiling of Christ's Identity. Irony and Glory, the Unveiling of Christ's or Jesus' Identity. Listen then to the word of our Lord. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right in the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet, even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that this man testified against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him and say to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. I am convinced that the antidote for lukewarmness in our lives, in our churches, is for us to have the curtains of heaven pulled back and contemplate the glory of Jesus. That's what we see in Isaiah chapter 6 when Israel was in crisis. The prophet had the privilege of the unveiling glory of Jesus on the throne. And he repented from his sins and was sent to mission. That's the same through, through truth in Revelation chapter 3 where they allowed to see a church Look, warmness. And Christ knocking on their door to open it, to have fellowship with them. But amazingly, if you continue reading Revelation, Jesus is knocking on the doors of the church. But in order for the church to open up their hearts, another door is open in chapter 4. And heavens is open. And John is shown to him the glory of the God the Father with the Spirit in chapter 5, the, God, the glory of the Lamb. The unveiling of the Trinity with all his glory. That's what we need against our lukewarmness, coldness, and to have reformation and revival in our lives. And I believe this text will unveil our Lord Jesus Christ with irony. Yes, with irony. 
Because Mark's gospel has the purpose to show the identity of Jesus Christ. From the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then in the half of that gospel, many questions are raised by the characters of the gospel. For example, uh, the scribes in chapter 2, who can forgive sins but God alone? Who is this man? Or the disciples in chapter 4, in the storm, they ask, who then is this that even wind and water obey him? And then the other half of the gospel, you see the answers being given to the reader. Actually, through all the gospel, you see that in Jesus' baptism, God himself, the Father, saying, this is my Son, whom I am well pleased you see that in the transfiguration account, where God again says, this is my son, listen to him. With the confession of Peter in chapter 8, again, when Jesus says, why are people talking about me? Who do they say who I am? They, and then Peter says, you are the Christ. And now, another Revelation of who Jesus is, is in our text here in the trial of Jesus, in the council of the Jews. When the high priest asked him, who are you? Are you the son? The son of the blessed one? And then he answers it. So the identity of Jesus is given in our text here, who he is with four ironies. What is an irony? Irony is for you to, to stress a point by telling to a person the opposite of the reality that you are experiencing. For example, a very silly way for you to understand, you see a very skinny person and you say you are very fat. So you're stressing a point, the opposite of the reality. Or in our text, you see a type of irony that is very common, especially here as we, as we read. It's called a dramatic irony. A dramatic irony results from the audience sharing with the author knowledge unavailable to one or more characters. So we as a reader and the author are the only, the only person, the people who know what's going on and the characters of the, of the narrative do not know. That's an irony that you're going to see it. So he's going to tell us who Jesus is with four ironies through the identity of Jesus as the brave master, the true temple, the royal priestly judge, and the supreme prophet. Okay? Now, first one, the brave master. Who is Jesus? The brave master. Verses 53 and 54. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now, the camera of Mark, he turns now to the inside of the building after verses 54. To see the trial of Jesus. But verses 53 and 54, we see outside of the building... When Peter is warming himself. Now, that's a device that Mark uses in his narrative called sandwich. He begins a story, and then he inserts another story, and then he comes back to the story that he begun. It's a sandwich. It's exactly what you see here. He begins with Peter, warming himself with the guards, and then he leaves in begin to tell the story of Jesus in his trial with the Jews. And then he ends that trial and comes back to Peter from verses 66 until 72. And he tells about the denial of Peter while Jesus is being tried. And you see that that is the device because it repeats the same information of verses 53 and 54 that, that Peter was warming himself. See verse 67? Seeing Peter warming himself. And the young lady asked him, and then we know the story. He denied Christ three times. And then he wept bitterly. 
Now, the reason why Mark does this is for you to compare Jesus with Peter and see the irony of this story. It's for you to read the account and compare Peter with Jesus and see your brave master in comparison with a coward disciple. Jesus was falsely accused in verse 56. And Peter is truthfully accused in verses 67, in verses 69 and 70. Second, Jesus is accused of blasphemy after, te after telling the truth in verse 64. And Peter curses while telling a lie in verse 71. Jesus reveals his identity in verses 61 and 62, while Peter conceals and hides his identity, not telling them who he was in verses 67, 70, and 71. While Jesus bravely answers the high priest, revealing his identity, Peter is afraid of confessing he is Jesus' follower to a female servant of the high priest. Do you see the irony there? The most powerful man in Israel, the high priest, Jesus is bold enough to confess who he is. But Peter is so afraid to confess who he is to a little girl. While Peter is sitting with the guards in verse 54, in the courtyard, the guards are hitting Jesus in verse 65 for foretelling he will sit at the right hand of God. You see the contrast and the irony. And lastly, the lying Peter, the liar Peter, goes out free and without harm. And Jesus, who speaks the truth, is bound and tortured and taken to a cursed cross. What a great contrast, isn't it? What an irony. And here is for you to see the lesson To stop fearing man by fearing God. You see your brave master being strong and bold because he fears God instead of man. While a weak disciple fears man instead of God. You see this truth, children. So clear in the text, isn't it? Very clear. But I want you to see the greatness of your Savior and fear Him more. You should see yourself as Peter in contrast to your Savior and brave Master Jesus Christ. That's what you should do right now. In this irony, you see the good news of the denial of Peter and the greatness of our brave, brave master. Because it's a good news to see Peter with his denial, isn't it? A broken man, a sinful man, a wicked man, a liar man, just like you and me. Because there's a message of hope. There is grace for the chief of sinners like us. Because with this story, there is more grace in Jesus than there is sin in us. As Richard Sibbs once said. It's amazing gospel. Now listen to this because you see also the beauty of the literature of Mark. I want you to see that the gospel of Mark there's nothing like it in the world. The Bible is unparalleled as well, just like his Savior, just like his Lord. 
By denying and being ashamed, ashamed of Jesus in his adulterous and sinful generation, as Mark 8, 38, 38 says, Peter vividly illustrates Jesus' teaching of Mark 8.35, which says that the one who seeks to save his life will lose it. Remember that? Ironically, in contrast, Jesus in the trial is the one who is willing to lose his life in order to gain life. It's an explanation of the call of discipleship that Jesus gives in chapter 8. To deny ourselves, to take up the cross and follow him. To lose our lives, to gain life. And Peter is doing the opposite here. Do you see? Peter who deserves to lose his life because he's trying so hard to save it. Will have it bought back by the one but the special one, but the amazing one who will save his life precisely, ironically precisely, because Jesus Christ is willing to lose it. This contrast, contrast between Jesus and Peter in the Sandrine trial ironically explains how the brave master Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for his feeble disciple Peter, as Mark 10, 45 Teaches. I came not to be served, but to serve, to serve, and to give my life a ransom for many. And you see this laying out for us in this trial, in the most beautiful way. And that is for you and for me as well. Because of his bravery not to save his own life, because his bravery. Bravery to give his own life for us. Our lives were saved and our sins forgiven. Therefore, beloved Christian of Emmanuel Church, you should rejoice in your brave master. Go boldly to him like Peter did after the resurrection of Jesus. As we learn in John chapter 21, right? Because he, re he experienced repentance. His weeping here is not uh, tears of crocodile. It's real tears. He wept. And after he experienced the forgiveness of this brave master, he went boldly to him. So rejoice and celebrate and enjoy this brave master Jesus. And now with this in mind, that he lost his life in order to save yours, lose your life because of him. Now, when you see this, if you have the unveiling of this brave master before you, you now can obey his command. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, because I did exactly like that for you. And for Peter. But lastly, in this first point, at the same time, rejoice with trembling. Yes, you should rejoice with this brave master, but with trembling as you learn in Psalm 2. How can I rejoice with trembling? If I'm happy, how can I be fearful at the same time? If my sins are forgiven like that, why do I have to fear God? John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, explains it in his little book, Fear of God. It's, a, it's amazing truth. Listen to him. For if God shall come to you indeed and visit you with forgiveness of sin, that visit removeth the guilt. That's why you rejoice, right? It removeth the guilt because of forgiveness, what we did, he did on the cross. But, that's a very important but, for you to understand the fear of God. But at the, same, at the same time, it increaseth the sense of thy filth. And I think exactly what Peter, I think he felt. The filthiness of his denial in contrast of this amazing master, brave master. It removes your guilt, but increase your sense of your filth. 
in the sense of this, that the God hath forgiven a filthy sinner will make, will make thee both rejoice and tremble. What a truth. And that is exactly what we have here with this brave master. That's the secret for you not to fear man, but to fear God alone. That's the wisdom behind this text, do you see? It's for you to see the irony of this brave master and to rejoice in him, but with trembling. Because you see your darkness in light of his righteousness and amazing forgiveness of sin. And then, and like Jesus, we'll give you boldness, as it happened with Peter in Acts 3 and 4, because he will meet the same guys that he met here, and he will act like Jesus in such a way that they will recognize this guy is walking, he's a follower of Jesus. Remember that in Acts 3? Yes, the unveiling of Christ as the brave master for feeble disciples like us. What an irony. Secondly, yes, who is Jesus? Not only a brave master, he's the true temple. Read with me verses 55 and 59. It says this, now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none, for many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him saying, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet, even about this testimony, did not agree. You see, in verse 58, the witnesses accuse falsely Jesus. They falsely accuse Jesus. But what is one of their accusations? They brought many accusations. But Mark here stresses one. And the accusation and the false witness is this, that Christ would destroy the temple made by human hands, and in three days would rebuild another not made with human hands. But look, pay attention to this. Although, even though the accusation was false because Jesus never said that he would destroy the temple. He never said that. And because they, not, they did not fully understand what they were saying and were accusing with evil motives, their witness, and here is the irony, that witness ironically came to pass, right? It came to pass. Yes, the temple was destroyed. And then the third day, another one was built. That's exactly what Jesus said in John chapter 2. Yes, even though the accusation was false because of evil motives and not saying the right way, in the death of Christ, the accusation turned out to be true. What an irony in the text. In his death, Christ destroys a necessity of physical temple. A physical temple, there's no need anymore. And in his resurrection, Jesus builds a temple not made by human hands. What is it? Himself. In his ascension, Jesus enters in the temple not made by human hands. What is it? Heaven. Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 24. With his entire work, life, death, resurrection, and ascension, Jesus builds another temple not made by human hands. Do you know what it is? You and I. The church. Colossians 2, Ephesians 2, 11. The church. Do you see? The false accusation turned out to be true in order to reveal who the true temple is. Who is the true temple? Jesus Christ. The head and his body. The church. That's the second irony. 
In the destruction of his temple, Jesus builds another temple. With the sacrifice of his temple, Christ builds another temple, resurrection and the church. Now, this identity that he is, the true temple, through this irony. But false accusation turn out to be true reality. It's our hope for death. Isn't it? 1 Corinthians 15, John 11. The destruction of your body or your temple, your body, is an evidence for the construction of another temple. Because of Jesus' work, when you die, you will be in his arms. What a hope. But more than that, you will have a new body, just like Jesus with resurrection. What a truth. And here's the application for your life and my life. Do not buy the lie and follow death, please. I warn you, please. Do not buy the false testimony and follow death. What do you mean? I mean, do not have death as your shepherd. As Psalm 49, 14 says. Do you know that we can have a shepherd that is called death? Yes, Psalm 49, 14. Read at home. And so many of us, so many Christians who say that believe in the resurrection, life after death, live in the reality of having death as their shepherd. But this text, this truth, that he is the true temple, the true resurrection, is for you to realize and make you remember the resurrection of his body and yours in the future. In other words, that your life cannot be summed up here in this world. You know, with this pandemic, is the past two years, it made me meditate how we still Christians are so afraid of death. How I am afraid of death. How society follows death. That this truth of resurrection of the new temple, even for Christians, is so far away from us. It's so abstract. It's not palpable. And I think we still believe in the serpent's lie. When the serpent slide said, surely you shall never die, Eve. You shall never die. And when a pandemic knocks on our door, their reality becomes so real because so much in our lives we have bought that lie that we shall never die. Yes, I know about death. Yes, sometimes I see people dying. But I live as if I will never die. We still believe in the serpent's lie, serpent's testimony. But here is the true temple truth, so amazing truth, ironic truth. But ironically, the true temple makes the serpent's lie to be true in the gospel. The lie turns out to be true in the gospel. How come? The truth that Jesus is the true temple, that he is life after death, that he is the resurrection and life, makes us believe that even if we die, we will live forever with him. Because of our true temple, Jesus, we shall never die. Our world is not here, beloved Christian. Do you see the irony? The lie of the serpent becomes the truth in Jesus alone. 
And your life is not here. He will give you a new life, new body, new world with him forever. And that must shake you and me. Let me put some flesh in this application for you to see it, the importance of this truth. Do you know Johnny Erickson data? Have you read her books? If you haven't, when she was 17, I think 18 years old, she, do she dove in a lake. And she hit her head. And she was paralyzed from the neck down since 1967. She can only move her head. Still today. Can you believe that? In one of her books, she was in a meeting, a prayer meeting, I think, where the person who was leading the meeting said for everyone to kneel down. And she could not do it. And she started to cry. Not because she could not do it, because she remembered this. Listen, I suddenly realized that when I get to the wedding feast of the Lamb, heaven, the first thing that I will be able to do on my resurrected legs is to drop down on grateful and glorified knees before Jesus. And then I'm going to get on my feet and dance and dance. And then she asked, can you imagine the hope that the resurrection gives for someone with a spinal cord injury like me? Can you imagine the hope that this gives a manic depressive? Now listen to, to this truth. That's the truth of the temple, the true temple of Jesus Christ. No religion, absolutely children and young people and you adults. Believe this, absolutely no religion, no philosophy, no teaching, no other philosophy offers us new bodies. Not just new minds and hearts. Only in the gospel of Jesus Christ can people hurting like me have such a hope to live. That's your true temple. That's your savior. That's your brave master. That's your resurrection and life. Do you believe it? How can you live in a life so broken like us without such a hope? How dare you live like that? That's why Jesus is unique. Nothing like the gospel. Christianity is unparalleled like we sung with Psalm 86. There's no one like our God. No one. And if there is anyone here who doesn't believe in the gospel, I challenge you. There's no truth like this. And we, I want to remind you of the truth that we learn in Revelation. About the new heaven and new earth. That the resurrection will bring us. Yes, you will eat from the tree of life in paradise of God. You will, we will receive the crown of life. We will eat the hidden man and receive the white stone with our new name written on it. We will have power over the nation. We will be clothed with the white garments. And Christ will confess our name before the Father and the angels. And Jesus will write upon, the name, upon us the name of God. His new name, the name of the city of God. Jesus will grant us to sit with him in his throne as he sat down with the Father in his throne. And we will reign with him forever. This resurrection life has already begun in Jesus Christ. It's right now ours. Take possession of it by faith. And the best of all, we will be with him, our true temple, forever and forevermore. That's heaven. Do you desire it? Do you long for it? 
Let that sink in. Let heaven be open and unveil your Lord, your resurrection in life, your true temple. And not believe in the lie of the serpent anymore. Come on. Bring on. Bring on pandemic. Bring on death. With our temple, we will not be afraid. Thirdly, who is Jesus? The brave master, the true temple, but he's also the royal priestly judge. Verses 60 and 64 says this. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that this man testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sit at the right hand of power and come in with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. At the outset, I'll let you know what the irony is. The ironically truth is this. The judge of the universe, Jesus Christ, in this passage, is judged by depraved human judges. You see this? The judge of the universe is judged by depraved judges. You see, all these times in this trial, Jesus has been silent concerning all the accusations and false witnesses against him. But when the high priest asked him if he is the Son of God, you see the climax of the narrative. He answers it. He opens his mouth because it has a purpose on it. And in his confession, Jesus could have responded the high priest with many titles, with many names, and with many works that he has. But he purposely chose Daniel 7 and Psalm 110 to show that he is the king of kings and the high priest of all the high priests. Isn't it ironic? A high priest is, is judging him when he is the high priest of all. When he is the king of all. It's the text of Psalm 110 where every enemy will be put under his feet. Where the truth of Daniel 7, that he will be ascended into heaven. Where the ancient of days, God himself is on the throne. And he will have dominion over all the nations. That the text that Jesus is quoting. I am that one. I am the Lord of lords. I am the God of everything. I am the creator in flesh before you. I am the judge of the universe. What an amazing claim. What an incredible affirmation. The one who has all power is under human power. Now listen to this. In order to save. The one who has all the power imaginable is under a tiny little power that he himself came to them to save you and me. The judge who is judged is the third irony of the text. What a literature. What a piece of literature. Now, what I'm trying to do with you is for you to see the truth of who Jesus is. So that you can see a holy life flows from his identity. Let me say that again. I want you to see that a holy life must flow from you seeing who he is. And be united with that God man. For you to learn who Jesus is. 
is the condition, is the precondition for you to live for him. It flows from his identity. So the identity that he is the royal priestly judge of the universe that is judged by corrupted men like you and me and those guys. The first lesson that should flow from this that I thought about is that this should end all gossip and ill talk about any person in the, in, in the church. Isn't it right? If you believe that the judge of universe was judged for you, it should end all gossip. I'm talking about someone to someone else that talks evil about him. That when we do that, when I'm talking ill about someone to someone else, the presupposition behind my slander is that I am better than that person. You see, I assume in my gossip that I am better than that person. And if that is not so, I would never defame about that person. I would go after her because I'm just like that person. And I would like to convince and call that person to repentance. But when I gossip and slander someone, the assumption is that I'm better than, than that person. But if the judge of my corrupted life was judged for me, how can I judge with you talk about my neighbor? A Christian gossiper is a contradiction in terms when you see your royal priestly judge being judged for you. It doesn't make any sense. It should end right now. And this include also those who hate gossip and gossip about those who gossip. That's right, Pastor. That's so right. I hate those, those who gossip. That ends as well. That should end as well. Maria, I can't stand her. She gossips all the time. She's always slandering someone. You are doing the very thing you are complaining about, Maria. If you slander the slander, then you are also a slander. Do you see that? If you really believe the gospel of the judge being judged for you, gossip must end now. Do you? Second lesson. This truth should produce love for those that disagree with you theologically. Yes. Even when you do not agree with certain important doctrines, you give your life for that person. Even having your own doctrine conviction and maintaining your viewpoint, you give your life for that person serving him. Because Jesus was judged for you in one of the ways was your theological error as well. You know, John Newton, the Puritan, on the article that he wrote, on a letter actually, on controversy. The basically point of his letter is this. Not only self-righteousness in good works we have, but also we have self-righteousness in sound doctrine. So see your judge being judged so that you should not have self-righteousness to being reformed. The only perfect theologian died for you who are an imperfect theologian that in some doctrine is mistaken. How can you not do the same for your brother and neighbor? Third, this truth should make you forgive people that wronged you. Now, I want you to picture that because I bet most of us or even all of us experienced somebody who wronged you so deeply. Can you picture that? Can you see it? Don't think about anybody else. Think of that person that wronged you so deeply. Christ had all the power and all the right to condemn you because of our sin. But he was condemned for you and forgave you of all your wrongdoings. How can you have the audacity not to forgive others when they ask for forgiveness? When you are just like that person, when you sin against your Savior, how? How can I do this? Actually, that's the only power that we can have to really give forgiveness to someone, is to see your judge to be judged for you. This truth should make you also forgive yourself. Is there anyone here? 
who does not forgive yourself? Is there anyone here who has such a difficult time to get rid of that burden in your conscience because of that horrible sin that you committed? Or frustration in life? When you do not forgive yourself, when you repent and confess your sins to God, you are putting yourself in the place of the only judge, God. You are always beating yourself up for many failures and deceptions. How dare you when the only judge that can really condemn you in the gospel, if you really believe, forgive you? Are you God? Or is somebody else God? Yes, God forgave me, but my father didn't. Yes, God forgave me, but my spouse didn't. Yes, God forgave me, but my brother didn't. Yes, God saved me, but I didn't forgive myself. How can you do that? Are you God? Is your father God? Or anybody else is God? The judge of the universe was judged for you, said you may recognize his forgiveness. Do not act as if you were God or anybody else is God. Only God in Jesus Christ is God. And that God became man and was under condemnation in the false trial, in the horrible trial to save you and forgive you. God already did everything for you. Just rest on it. Rest it. And lastly, that's our hope when we see so much unrighteousness in this life. I come from a third world country. So much unrighteousness. How can I believe in a God who did not experience unrighteousness as well. And we see that only in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God became man, and in this trial, experienced injustice in such a way that he didn't only die for us, but in a way that he experienced injustice. He knows what we go through when we experience injustice. So, he also died with us. What a Savior. What a God we have. What a Jesus. Yes, he is the royal priestly judge who was judged for you. That's the third irony. Now, lastly, and I think this last identity of our Lord is the most amazing in the text. Just one verse. Just one verse. But for me, it's mind-boggling. Yes. Verse 65 says this. And some began to spit on him, to cover his face, and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. Can you imagine that? The creator in flesh being treated like that. Now Mark will unveil Jesus as the ultimate prophet. Yes, the ultimate prophet. See, they are mocking Jesus. You see this, the mockery? They are mocking Jesus, saying, prophesy. They blindfold our Lord. And we know from the other Gospels, they hit him and they ask, tells us, who hit you? Are you not a prophet? You just said in the trial that you, you see the accusations? You prophesied that the temple will be destroyed and in the third day you will build again. That's a prophecy. Are you a prophet? You cannot tell in seconds who hit you? You just said that you will come in the clouds of heaven. You just said it. You were prophesied just now. Now, yeah, you were a prophet. You are not a prophet. You are a charlatan. You are fake. 
They are mocking our Savior. They are trying to make fun of Him. They are boldly proclaiming that He is a false prophet who cannot even predict or guess who hit Him. Do you see that in the text? Jesus, a false prophet? And here, why I think it's the most interesting part of the narrative. Here's the most interesting irony of all the other ironies in this narrative This for this reason. This irony is the fulfillment of all the other ironies that we just saw today. This irony is the fulfillment of all the other ironies. At the moment, pay attention to this, at the moment that they are mocking him, Beating Jesus, hating Jesus, and telling him that he is no prophet at all. The fragility, the weakness, and the denial of Peter are then fulfilling Christ's earlier prediction in Mark 14, verses 27 to 31. That Peter would deny him three times. You see the the importance of the literature? The sandwich begins with Peter, ends with Peter, and the middle is the trial of Jesus. At the moment that they are mocking Jesus as a false prophet, we as readers, that's the dramatic irony, we as readers, we know more than characters, more than the characters can know. Because at the moment that they are mocking Jesus, the prophecy of the denial of Peter is being fulfilled. Isn't it amazing? And the destruction of the temple and its rebuilding are now starting to take place as Jesus predicted his death and resurrection in Mark 10. And that entire trial was the result of Jesus' prophecies in Mark 10 and Mark 12 and of his prophecies of Old Testament even coming down to the detail that they would spit on him. Mark 10 tells that. Mark Mark 10 Whoa! Glorious, extraordinary Savior. There's no one like Him. He's simply amazing. Don't you agree with me? He's incomparable. When human beings think they are mocking at Jesus, Jesus, without even saying a word in the trial, without even saying a word, He's laughing at the mocking. You see that? And letting us know his followers, his readers, that he is mocking their mockery without saying anything. This reminds, see the beauty of the literature. I want you to see the beauty of the Bible. I want you to see the beauty of this, of this gospel. Because what Mark is doing is for you to remember Psalm 1 and 2. This reminds Psalm 1 and 2 when we read together. One can perceive that the mockers of Psalm 1, remember the mockers of Psalm 1? Will be mocked by God in Psalm 2. As Psalm 2 says. Why I think Mark is, is make reference to Psalm 2? Because it says, are you the son of the blessed one? That's a reference to Psalm 2. That's a reference to Psalm 2 that the high priest is making. And Jesus, without saying a word, to say, yes, I am the Son of God. The Psalm 2 is referring to because I'm mocking your mockery. What a great literature. Children, I challenge you, go try to find any human literature in the world. You will not find something like this. So rich, so amazing like this. It is just Unbelievable. While Jesus' antagonists are mocking Jesus, Mark is ironically mocking at their mocking against the ultimate prophet by letting the reader know more than the evil characters of his story could. The one who was considered a false prophet turned out to be the supreme, ultimate, true prophet of all. That's our Savior, beloved church. Isn't it now for you on the spot to worship in your heart this Jesus? As is unveiled in this text. But let me end this sermon. 
showing that the cross is powerfully the most ironic prophecy in all history, isn't it? Yes, it is. The cross of Jesus Christ is powerfully the most ironic prophecy in all history. How so? Because on the cross, with defeat, we have victory. On the cross, with humiliation, we see exaltation. On the cross, with the wrath of God, is where we experience the love of God. With the darkness, with everything with darkness at noon on the cross, we see light coming forth. With the perdition of the Son on the cross, we see salvation. With His service, we see His kingdom. On His death on the cross is where we find life. On His condemnation that we find forgiveness. On His wounds, on His wounds we are healed. On the horror of the cross is where we find peace with God. In His ugliness. Ugliness of Jesus Christ on that cross is where we find the most beautiful thing in the world. He experienced hell so that we can have heaven. He experienced enmity against God so that we can have his friendship. And in weakness is that we see power. In poverty that he was naked that we see riches. In his, his failure that we see success. In the betrayal that he see, we see his faithfulness. In his loss we see gain. And with the shame of the cross is where we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Irony and glory, the unveiling of Christ's identity is the antidote against lukewarmness in your life. If that cannot do that, I cannot think anything else can do it. This evening and every Sunday, is for you to be exposed to the glory of that amazing Jesus Christ and his work on that cross. Jesus is the gospel, children. He is the good news. Because there is no better news than himself. Heaven without him is hell, and hell with him is pure heaven. What a Savior. Jesus is the gospel, a brave master, a true temple, a royal priest judge, and a supreme prophet. And I want you to go home with the, the same ironies, or well, I mean with other ironies, that John Calvin brought to bear in his preface of a New Testament translation, French translation in uh, 1534. It's a bit lengthy, I grant you that. But I hope you pay attention to the glory of the gospel in Jesus Christ with the ironies that Calvin brings here. And we can end with the identity of your Savior being unveiled. And by the Holy Spirit, we can have the privilege to see his glory. Listen to this, please. Without the gospel, says Calvin, Everything is useless in vain. Without the gospel, we are not Christian. Without the gospel, all riches is poverty, all wisdom folly before God. And strength is weakness, and all the justice of man is under the condemnation of God. But by the knowledge of the gospel, we are made children of God, brothers of Jesus Christ, fellow townsmen with the saints, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, heirs of God with Jesus Christ, by whom the poor are made rich, you see, the weak strong, the fools wise, the sinner justified, the desolate comforted, the down insured, the slaves free. It is the power of God for the salvation of all those who believe. It follows that every good thing we could think or desire is to be found in the same Jesus Christ alone. For he was sold to buy us back, captive to deliver us, condemned to absolve us. He was made a curse for our blessing, a sin offering for our righteousness, merit that we may be made fair. He died for our lives so that by him, 
See the ironies? Fury is made gentle. Wrath appeased. Darkness turned into light. Fear be assured. Despise or despise. Dead canceled. Labor lightened. Sadness made merry. Misfortune made fortunate. Difficulty easy. Disorder ordered. Division united. Ignominy enabled. Rebellion subjected. Intimidation intimidated. Ambush uncovered. Assaults assailed. Force forced back. Combat combated. War warred against. Vengeance avenged, torments tormented, damnation dimmed, the abyss sunk into the abyss, hell transfixed, death dead, mortality made immortal. In short, mercy has swallowed up all misery, and goodness all misfortune. Now this is the, this is so beautiful truth. Listen to this because of the gospel, the ironies that we see in Jesus. For all these things which were to be the weapons of the devil in his battle against us. And the sting of death to pierce us are turned for us into exercise which, can, which we can turn to our profit. Isn't it amazing? If we are able to boast with the apostle saying, Oh hell, where is thy victory? Or death, where is thy sting? It is because by the Spirit of Christ prophesies the elect, we live no longer. But Christ lives in us. And we are by the same Spirit seated among those who are in heaven, so that for us the world is no more. Even while our conversation is in it, but we are content in all things, whether country, place, condition, clothing, meat, and all such things. And we are comforted in tribulation, joyful in sorrow, glorifying under vituperation, abounding in poverty, warmed in our nakedness, patient amongst evil, evils, living in death. And this is what we should, in short, in short, seek in the whole scripture, truly to know Jesus Christ and infinite riches that are comprised in him and are offered to us by him from God the Father. End quote. And in Mark 14, 53 to 72, we see Christ in his infinite riches by noticing who he is the brave master for weak disciples like us, the true temple to build spiritual temple, the church, the judge who is judged to save false judges, and the supreme prophet who reveals the ultimate prophecy, the cross. That portrayal in Mark 14, 53 to 72 is only a small, tiny sample of what the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, really is. Are you able to admire him, to worship him, and adore him right now? If you are, then fear God. Long for resurrection. Stop gossiping and forgive others and yourself. And go home loving the gospel. Let us pray. Lord, without the Spirit, our words are just empty, empty words. We will not do anything. But we desperately ask you to work on the hearts, especially those who are in, uninterested in the truth of the gospel today. Work on their hearts, O oh Lord. Work in the hearts of the children here my children, all those children here, work in the hearts of the young people here. They are fascinated to so things that will pass away so fast. Show the glory of the gospel to them, O oh Lord. And be with the adults here and old people that they can long for Jesus Christ even more. For those who still do not believe in the gospel, make them believe, O oh Lord, through their word. Make them believe, please. And for those who are Christian but are in sin, 
Grant them repentance, O oh Lord, because of Jesus. Grant them repentance. And I also pray for this church, for the leadership, thinkers, elders, and everybody that work here. Continue to bless this church, O oh Lord, and to use it to the advancement of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name that we pray. Amen.